the outrage over the <clears throat> attempted assassination of 15-year-old Malala Yousafzai by the Taliban, who was shot merely for demanding girls' education, the mass protests against the assassination of Shokri Baled, the Tunisian socialist leader by Islamists, and Amina Taylor's topless activism, saying, my body is not the source of anyone's honor. The anger, and, and sorry, fuck your morals, oops, sorry. Um, the anger over the um, murder of Neda Agha Sultan in protests in Tehran in broad daylight, the February uh, Egyptian atheist Alia Magda El Mahdi's nude scream against misogyny, the February day of action against sexual terrorism in Egypt, and the Harlem Shake in front of the Islamist Muslim Brotherhood headquarters in Egypt. Yes. <laughs> Even if you're not looking, you can still see the immense resistance and dissent taking place day in and day out. It's a new period of human development after decades of Islamism, US-led militarism, unbridled free market reign, cultural relativism, and the retreat of all things universal. Today is an era of the 99% movement and revolutions and uprisings in the Middle East and North Africa, many of them female-led. Whilst it may sometimes be hard to see this, given the perceived gains by Islamists in the region, but in fact, as counter-revolutionary forces aimed at suppressing the revolutions, the change in era is palpable. Nonetheless, many post-modernists post and cultural relativists, leftists, liberals, feminists, remain firmly on the side of the Islamists. Any opposition to Sharia law which is based on the Quran, the Hadith, sayings and uh, actions of the Prophet Muhammad, and Islamic jurisprudence, any opposition to the veil, and Islamic misogyny are met with charges of racism and Islamophobia, cultural imperialism, and more. Those who say so, though, have bought into the culturally relativist notion that societies in the Middle East and North Africa, and even the so-called Muslim community here in the West, are homogeneous, Islamic, conservative, but there is no one homogeneous culture anywhere. Since it is those in power that determine the dominant culture, this point of view sees Islamist values and sensibilities as those of the authentic Muslim. But as Musa Buderi, who's a professor in the oldest uh, university in, Palest in the Palestinian Authority, he was threatened for posting a, f a cartoon on his door, uh, office door, what he said is Islamists resort to abuse and threats of physical violence, attempting to appropriate to themselves the sole authority of what Muslims can and cannot think, can and cannot do. There are and will remain as many different Muslims as there are unfettered minds. He was threatened for posting this cartoon on his office door. The, the man says, you look gorgeous today, dear. I'm here. He was threatened to death for this. Um, in fact, Muslims, or those labeled as such, include secularists, include ex-Muslims, atheists, free thinkers, socialists, women's rights activists, LGBT campaigners. Even someone like Salman Rushdie, the wonderful Salman Rushdie, speaks for Muslims. As writer Hanif Qureshi says, he speaks for their doubts. He speaks the bits of them that they actually think and feel sometimes. Do I really believe in this stuff but can't say? Conflating Islamism with Muslim is a narrative that is peddled by the Islamists in an attempt to feign representation, restrict dissent, and prescribe the limits of acceptable expression. Those who assert that a demand for secularism and opposition to the veil and Sharia law is foreign, it's culturally inappropriate, are only considering Islamism's sensibilities and values, not those of the many who resist. This shouldn't be surprising. A large, young population in many countries of the Middle East and North Africa brings with it challenges to the status quo, as does the recent women-led revolutions and the backlash against Islamism. As the 34-year-old Egyptian female cartoonist, Dua Eladl, who calls herself a Muslim anarchist, 
and is facing blasphemy charges for her political cartoons that poke fun at Islamists, says, the extremists don't scare me. Whatever they do, I will continue to use my skills to poke fun at them. They must understand that we Egyptians have changed with the revolution and we will not go backwards. In the same way that there are opponents of nude protests and supporters of the veil, Islamism and Sharia law in the West, there are also supporters of nude protests and opponents of the veil of Islamism and Sharia law in the East. Even more so, as you will find no greater opposition to Islamism than from those who have lived and suffered under its rule. This has nothing to do with cultural imperialists patronizingly rescuing Muslim women any more than the fight for women's suffrage was a rescue attempt and a form of cultural imperialism. After all, the idea was foreign to begin with and started in one specific place. Only those who see their rights and their lives separate and different from those who are deemed other and who have bought into or are selling the Islamist narrative can see solidarity and the demand for equality and secularism in this warped way. Ironically, like the far right, which despises multiculturalism, yet benefits from its idea of difference to scapegoat the other and promote its own form of white identity, politics, the postmodernists also use multiculturalism to side with the oppressor by demanding respect and tolerance for difference, no matter how intolerable. Here's the Taliban marriage counseling service asking, have you tried throwing rocks at her? As, as Algerian Mariam Hele Lucas says, however, difference and diversity are double-edged concepts. We should never forget that they have been used by reactionary forces to maintain in their difference by force people and categories of populations. What lies behind respect for difference is the deep desire that the other remain different. Defending secularism, free expression, and equality, opposing Sharia law and Islamic states have nothing to do with prejudice against Muslim communities, racism, and Islamophobia. Saying so ignores the immense dissent, including amongst those considered Muslims, and denies the social and political struggles, the class politics. Clearly, criticism of religion or a far-right political movement, which Islamism is, has nothing to do with racism. Here's a great Jesus and Mo cartoon. Jesus says, if we want to live together peacefully in a multicultural society, we must ensure that everyone's fundamental beliefs are protected from attack and ridicule. And the barmaid says, I don't want my fundamental beliefs to be protected from attack or ridicule. Thanks. Please feel free to attack or ridicule them anytime you wish. Muhammad's like, racist. <laughs> Islamophobia, in my opinion, is a political term used to scaremonger people into silence. Charges of Islamophobia have been coined not because of concern about anti-Muslim bigotry, because the main concern of these apologists is to defend Islam and Islamism. If they were really so concerned about Muslims or those labeled as such, they would oppose not support Sharia law and Islamism and stop justifying Islamic terrorism, which kills more Muslims, so-called Muslims, than anybody else. Here's the head of the Iranian regime saying, and this is how we handle sassy teenage girls. As women living under Muslim law say, fundamentalist terror is by no means a tool of the poor against the rich, of the third world against the West, of people against capitalism. It is not a legitimate response that can be supported by progressive forces of the world. Its main target is the internal democratic opposition to their theocratic project and to their project of controlling all aspects of society in the name of religion, including education and the legal system. When fundamentalists come to power, they silence the people. They physically eliminate dissidents, writers, journalists, poets, musicians, painters, like fascists do. Like fascists, they physically eliminate the untermensch, the subhumans, among them the inferior races, gays, mentally or physically disabled people, and they lock women in their place, which as we know from experience ends up being a straitjacket. US suffragist 
and ab abolitionist Elizabeth Cady Stanton once said that the Bible and church have been the greatest stumbling blocks in the way of women's emancipation. This is true in particular today with regards Islam and Islamism. Of course, when speaking of Islam or any religion, I'm not talking about religion as a personal belief. Everyone has a right to religion or atheism, but Islam today is not a personal matter, but the banner of a far-right political movement, an industry, a mafia, a killing machine. Those who equate opposition to religious misogyny with racism and an attack on Muslims erroneously or more likely deceptively see an attack on misogynist beliefs and movements as an attack on people and choose to side with culture and religion over the lives and rights of real human beings. This culturally relativist perspective implies that women's liberation is only for those who are white and Western, and the rest of us are allowed freedom within the cultural and religious confines of Islam. <clears throat> So you have Islamic feminists like Shirin Ebadi, who got a Nobel Peace Prize as well, who will say that women have full rights under Islam. They don't need secularism. And if there's any problem, um, as we see mass murder on a daily basis, it's because of a, a misinterpretation of Islam. Um, and there are several problems with this pr perspective, and I just want to go into this a little bit because it is an issue that keeps coming up. Firstly, if we look at the Quran and the Hadith, which are the sayings and actions of Muhammad um, and, and what Sharia law is based on. It's full of anti-woman rules, like all religious uh, texts are. Uh, and even if you just leave aside Islamic jurisprudence to one side, which is another basis of Sharia law, stoning to death for adultery, for example, is in a, a hadith. Muhammad himself stoned a woman to death. But of course she begged him, and she had to beg him three times before he conceded. Um, and that's their defense of it. And um, the ha there's a, in the Quran, there's a surahs on, on domestic violence and, and uh, wife beating. Secondly, often when you have this discussion on rights with Islamists or people who are Islamic feminists, you, you should ask them what they mean by rights, because even Islamists will say that women have full rights under their rule. But that's because they don't see men and women as equal. They see them as complementary, and they don't think that women deserve the same rights as men do. Also, the problem with interpretation is that your interpretation is only one of many interpretations. And even if you have a good interpretation, it's usually a regressive imam or sharia judge that makes the decision. But more importantly, I guess the question is, is there a good interpretation of religious texts? Thank you. You're listening, good. If you follow the arguments made by the good interpretations, you'll soon realize the absurdity of this line of defense. Take Surah Al-Nisa, the women, in the Quran, where it says, as to the women on whose part you fear disloyalty and ill conduct, admonish them, refuse to share their beds, and then beat them. Now you have Islamic feminists saying that this is only meant to beat your wives li lightly or with a feather or a very thin stick. And, and the Sharia judge in Britain, because domestic violence is a crime, he'll say, well, as long as there's no mark on your left on your body and it doesn't hit your face and your genitals, that's not really violence. But the point is, the point is that no form of violence against women is acceptable, full stop. <laughs> Clearly, one cannot leave women's rights and lives at the mercy of religious rules and forms of interpretation. Religion is a personal matter. When it comes to religion in the state, in the law, in the educational system, then it is a matter not of personal belief, but of political power and social control. No religion frees women, particularly not one spearheading an inquisition and with access to political power. Women are freer the less of a role religion plays in the public space, in the state, in the judicial system, not the other way around. Secularism is a precondition for the improvement of women's status, all women, not just those who are Western. The conflation between Islamism and Muslim has meant that Islamist demands are seen to be the demands of those living in the Middle East and North Africa, but this is not the case. No 
one of the revolutions in the region had Islamist demands. The, it's a political movement with specific demands and characteristics. The revolutions in the Middle East were not demanding Sharia law, Islamic states, compulsory veiling, and <clears throat> so on and so forth. Islamism is a counter-revolutionary force that's used to suppress revolutions. And this is a perfect cartoon of this. People are out asking for education, for bread, for health care, opposing poverty and unemployment, and the Islamist is there saying, no bikini. Yeah. yeah. If people really wanted to live under medievalism, if it was really people's culture, Islamists would not need to impose their rules with such sheer brutality that they, the fact that they must control the streets and arrest and fine people for what they wear, for what they think, and with such barbarity and brutality is evidence enough that their rule is an imposition. Here's just one photo of millions of a woman being stopped on the street by the morality police and told to most probably remove her makeup or veil. Even though the veiling is compulsory, you have millions of women arrested or fined um, because it's not properly uh, done. So they, they wouldn't need this constant control if, if it was everybody's culture. Of course, there are people who prefer Sharia law to secular law, and a lot of them are actually born in the West, and thanks to multiculturalism and toler tolerance for the intolerable. Um, and as there might be people who wish racial apartheid was back and who wish slavery was back, uh, but that's irrelevant. Sharia law and Islamic states are oppressive. There is no right to oppress. The, the postmodernist friends of Islamists tell us that our demands are Western. But since when are secularism, rights, freedoms, equality, Western? It's interesting how Islamists use the latest Western technology to murder people and to bomb, bomb left, right, and center. The Iranian regime wants nuclear technology, and these very same friends who tell us women's rights are Western demand the right for nuclear technology for the Islamic regime of Iran. It's interesting how it's not Western when it's technology that they use to suppress people, but when it comes to women's rights, when it comes to freedoms, these rights suddenly become Western and foreign. But even if rights are Western, which they're not, they were fought for by progressive social movements and the working class, and they belong to all of humanity. In the words of women's rights campaigners who chanted on the streets of Tehran in 1979 in opposition to compulsory veiling, a, a mass movement that was crushed by the Islamic movement, some of the slogans were neither Eastern nor Western, women's rights are universal, and freedom, not Islam, freedom is our culture. In this new era, after decades of brutality, terrorism, and militarism, it is finally our moment to shine. It is we who must now be on the offensive. The Islamist obsession with controlling and targeting women and the many decades of resistance, along with a new era of revolutions, has meant that the women's liberation movement is at a place where it can bring Islamism to its knees. Whilst misogyny will not end with an end of Islamism, the situation of women will improve greatly as one of the leading proponents of feminicide is brought to an end. Of course, no fight is predetermined. It depends on sheer human will and determination. The point, of course, is which side each of us will stand in this battle. As the late Marxist Mansur Hekmat has said, we are not sitting in judgment of the world. We are players and participants in it. Each of us are party to this historical worldwide struggle, which in my opinion, from the beginning of time until now, has been over the freedom and equality of human beings. Thank you. If you recall in the um, uh, panel in the, in the morning, we talked about doing an act of solidarity with atheists who are being imprisoned and persecuted. And uh, the, cup, the couple of atheists I wanted to focus on today are Amina Tyler. She's a 19-year-old atheist from Tunisia who posted a nude, a topless photo of herself um, saying, my body is not the source of anyone's honor and fuck your morals. She, she went into, she actually was kidnapped by her family with the help of the Tunisian government. She was uh, given a virginity test. She was sent to psychiatric, psychiatric tests. 
Uh, she was sent to an imam every day for moral lessons. Uh, she's finally managed to escape. Uh, she was given drugs so that she won't be able to be lucid. Uh, she's managed to escape. She's in hiding with friends. And she's done one more photo which says no more moral lessons. Uh, they're, they're collecting money to get her out of Tunisia right now. But I just saw a video of her protesting um, the minister of women in Tunisia. Um, and, and you know, opposing the Islamists in public. So she's, she's very much an activist we need to defend. There are the Bangladeshi bloggers, which you all know very well, um, the, the four who've been arrested. Uh, there's Imad Eddin Habib, he's the photo here. He's uh, a 22-year-old Moroccan who, um, in Morocco, it's illegal to eat while fasting. So he's posted photographs of himself eating during Ramadan. Uh, he started a whole movement to eat when you're not allowed to. And uh, he recently established the Council of Ex-Muslims of Morocco. Uh, since then, there's been a fatwa by the ruling ulama uh, saying that apostasy should be punished by death. He's also in hiding, and uh, we're supporting him. Um, and, and finally, of course, Alex Ahn, who you all know. So at the end of uh, maybe 10 minutes before the end of this talk, what I was hoping you would all do is write a message um, similar to what Imad has done. Some people have written, I'm an atheist or proud to be an atheist. It doesn't have to be very elaborate. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll all stand uh, maybe or, uh, in front of these photos and take an, an action of solidarity in their defense since we're all here together.